Troublesome times are here Filling men's hearts with fear Freedoms we all hold dear Now is that stage Humble your hearts to God Saves you from the chastening rod Seek the white pilgrim To rob Christians away Jesus is coming soon Morning or night or noon Many will meet their doom Trumpets will sound All of the dead shall rise Righteous me in the sky Oh, and when no one dies Heaven will find Troubles will soon be o'er, happy forevermore. When we meet on that shore, free from all care. Rising up in the sky, telling the world goodbye. Homeward we be, shall fly, glory to share. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night. Some times are here. Troublesome times fill men's hearts with fears. Freedoms we all hold dear now is at stake. Have I got the right class today? Humbling your hearts to God saves from the chastening rod. So seek the way pilgrims trod. And the last line says, Christians awake. St. John chapter 14, Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Our scripture setting this morning is when the disciples were trying to absorb all that is being said concerning the ending of a lifestyle that they had grown so much to love and appreciate. But Jesus tells him in a later verse, he says, I've got many things yet I want to tell you and say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Still, what has already been said is almost more than one can even imagine. The one who has called himself the resurrection and the life is now talking about dying. The one who has raised the dead now he himself is preparing to die. The one they've called master is now being humiliated and is about to suffer public shame by the Roman soldiers. Although many times you could find them down by the seashore with an open flame cooking fish and having fellowship or perhaps they may have gathered at Peter's house or one of the women's house for an evening meal. Today they've just been informed that of how they've just shared their last meal together and Jesus said, I will not eat of it again on this earth. So they're having to digest all of this information. Graduation day for them of being in a class with a master has arrived and even his coronation his crown will not be studied with 
precious jewels and diamonds and rubies embedded in gold and silver, but instead his crown is going to be a crown of thorns that will be pushed down into the scalp of his head and blood will stream down his innocent face. His love, his compassion for his disciples is only exceeded by his word to finish what the Father has sent him to do. So right in the middle of all the goodbyes and so longs and farewells and we'll meet again together someday, Jesus says something that had you not known him, it's almost laughable based upon circumstances. He says to them, in the midst of all the information that is coming, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. I can almost hear it now. And just for the record, this seems like an appropriate time for one of the disciples to stand up and say, but wait a minute. After all you've told us, and you've told us that you're going to be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and you've told us you're going to be crucified, now then, you know our love for you, but you're telling us that we're not to let our hearts be troubled. Right out of a heart of compassion, the anointed one in the darkest hour says, don't let allow your heart to be troubled. I'm sure that somewhere mixed, interlaced in the words, he must have said, you're going to face adversity. You're going to have to make tough decisions. There's going to be hard times and hardships. And yes, there is going to be trouble. But the secret to finishing, the key to walking out of the valley of the shadow of death is don't let trouble get in your heart. If you plan to win, don't let trouble in. Say it with me. If you plan to win, don't let trouble in. Oh sure, you're going to be tried and you're going to face adversity. Just don't allow trouble and hardship, lack and poverty, sickness and disease, don't let trouble drive you. Don't allow, allow trouble to determine what your destiny is going to be because trouble has a way of telling you it's over. Trouble says things will never be the same. Things cannot be the same. Trouble has a way of blinding you of future happiness and making you think things will never change. It will always be this way. So the truth is, you believe in God. Believe in me also. There will be times that God will put something into your spirit. You'll hear it in your ear. You'll hear it by the word. And it will literally, in the natural, seem unbelievable. There are things that God says that it, in the natural, it just does not make sense. But the only way you can bring yourself to believing in the word is you've got to believe in the one who's given the word. Jesus says, I'm going to reveal to you some things that are going to be so far out of reach of the natural mind to comprehend. You're just going to have to believe me. Jesus says, in my father's house. Huh. In my father's house are many mansions. You've got to believe me when I tell you that. In my father's house are many mansions. You haven't seen them yet, but I have. He said, if it were not true, if it were not so, if this was not how it is, he said, I would have never brought it up. I would have never mentioned it to you. But now, not only in my father's house are many mansions, he says, but I just want you to know that when, whatever you're facing now, and you cannot see me, 
You want to look for me across the fire. You want to look for me at the table and I won't be there. But I want you to know this one thing. Write it down, John. Put it down. I have gone to prepare a place for you. Even though you cannot see me, I still exist. And my existence is on your behalf. I'm preparing a place for you. And I've got to leave this world for a while in order to finish the plan of my father. Listen to me, Andrew. Listen, Peter, James, and John. You may have thought this was all there was to it. Sure, we've had some good times together, but I did not leave the splendors of heaven. I did not leave the glory realm to come here to this earth and restore the present day government. I'm not here to make sure that every nation is democracy. I didn't leave my father's system which is righteous in order to come here and overthrow some ungodly administration. I know this may be hard for you to understand, but Jesus said, believe me, when things stop making sense, when words no longer keep up with changing events, Jesus steps on board and says, you believe me, you believe me. Somebody shout, I believe. believe. Come on, everybody shout, "I I believe. Say, I can believe. Sometimes we get so caught up in political affairs and elections that we are prone to think this is all there is to it. Our heart breaks when people don't like our president or when the one that we wanted does not get elected. And we're made to believe that this is as good as it will ever get. It's only going to get worse from here. I don't think so. Say out loud with me, I don't think so. I don't know what you're facing today, but I'm telling you, it only gets better for a child of God from here. It will not stay the same. Somebody shout amen. For you see, 2,000 years ago, Father God looked ahead in time and he saw President Ronald Reagan from California. The actor. And had you had had the ear working, you would have heard him say, I don't think so. Boy, aren't you glad I'm not running for president because I just lost your vote when I said what I did. George Bush from the don't mess with Texas state shows up on the scene. Oh, he's our answer. You hear the Lord, Father God, I don't think so. Bill Clinton from Hope, Arkansas, I don't think so. George W. Bush, that ain't him. President Obama, Looking down through time, Father God says, that ain't him. When the Father looks at a small, lonely hill called Calvary, and they're suspended between heaven and earth in his beaten body, he sees his only son with the spit from the Roman soldier clinging to his jaw. He doesn't even look like a human being. Father God looks from the portals of glory and he sees on that small lonely hill his only begotten son. And he says, that's him. Ah, that's him. That's him. He said, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Oh, no, it's not one we would have picked. But Father said, that's him. 
May I submit to you, this world keeps looking for a savior, but they're looking in the wrong places. Because the only one that can solve this world's problems I said the only one that can fix this sin problem in this world today is the one that was crucified 2,000 years ago on a hill called Calvary. The father's ultimate reason for sending his only begotten son was to get back what was lost in the garden. More than a mansion, more than streets of gold. God wants his children back at the table. So Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, but I will come again and I will receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. Where? Where is Jesus? Jesus is with the Father. Where does he want me? With the Father. And I don't know how much time you've spent thinking about it, but there is a reception committee that's been working on a deal in heaven for quite some time now. It's called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Ah, and the party is about to start. The celebration is about to begin. And the children are coming home. Little Johnny is coming home. The saints of God are coming home. And there's going to be one home coming like this world has never, will never know. It'll only take place in heaven. Years ago, I was out in California. It was Christmas time. We were spending it with some friends. We got up on Christmas Day in this luxury place that we were staying in this guy's house. No turkey and dressing. No pumpkin pie. No cranberry sauce. No pineapple rings on the top of glazed ham. No giblet gravy. No mama and daddy sitting laughing with the grandkids, no Douglas Allen, no Edward Lear Roland, no Beth, no Florence, no Margaret Jane. This ain't Christmas. So I waited until the afternoon, thinking I will call home to see how things are. Only I forgot we were two hours behind time. And they were about to offer prayer over the meal. And everybody's sitting at the table and my baby sister answers the phone and she says, hello. As soon as I heard her voice on the other end, I lost it. I could not talk. I can't breathe. I'm dying in California. Margaret said, hello. <laughs> You've got to understand this is before cell phones and before caller ID, but she could tell by the gargle who it was. I have not said anything, but someone in the background said, who is it? She says, it's hard. You know, the big baby. <laughs> I'm closing. Last evening, the phone call came from my cousin. And she said, Arthur, Carter died. Carter? Yeah, my baby. He's 25 years old. Please pray for us. Another call came from a man. He said, I got hunt. He said, I need you to, I need you to, 
I need you to go to court with me Tuesday. They're having a hearing. They're trying to take my baby away from me. Will you come and stand for me in the courtroom? May I submit to you this morning that you didn't have those babies only to lose them? You didn't have your family only to lose your family. You didn't go through all the pain just to hold them in your arms and give them away because you're now ready to get on with your life. And you want to go back to your career. We don't have children so we can learn how to change their diapers and teach them how to crawl and take their first steps and then say, I'm, I'm, I'm tired. I've had enough. I want out. Remember how you felt the first day of school. They walked down that long hallway. It was the happiest day of their life, but the saddest day of yours. They're so excited because it's their first day in school and you went back to your car and cried your eyes out. You couldn't wait for school to end that day. It was like eternity. You waited for that first glimpse of them to walk out of that building and you wanted to make sure everything was all right. No one had heard them and they lived through it because you didn't know if you were going to or not. I know we have working moms and dads and we've been told you're not supposed to get so involved with your children. But the truth is, whether you work at GE or used to work for Hostess, we don't work for ourselves. Come on, let's just get real. We don't labor for ourselves, we work for our family. Everything we do, we do it for the kids. We buy them toys, bicycles, Batman suits, Nintendos, iPhones, and Corvettes. We get their hair braided, their fingernails painted. We buy their makeup. We gladly do without. Why? So they can have life more abundantly. Sounds like you're trying to play God too, huh? I'm... I've come that you might have life and that you may have it more abundantly even if I'm starving to death. The truth is sometimes we may have to buy our children's shoes from Walmart while others are buying theirs from Dillard's, but yet in your heart you know it's your best. We buy diapers, bottles, balloons and hair bows, toys and bicycles, trampolines and clothes. We keep pouring and pouring with each passing day and when there's not enough, we'll find a way. You do without so they can have, but that makes you feel good because you're mom and dad. They go off to college and you grow apart. Though they're a hundred miles away, they still live in your heart. I made that up. Regardless of what some may say, we really are a lot like God. He said, the things that I do shall you do also. Everything that we do is for those we love. Whether if we do it for ourselves or for them, we're doing it for somebody we love. One day you're getting them out of Egypt. The next day it's the lion's den. Sometimes it's a fiery furnace and it just seems like there's no end. I'm going to roll again, aren't I? I'm doing good. They brag about killing the bear and the lion too. And you know the reason the enemy lost is because he saw you. We are a lot like God, aren't we? What I'm trying to show you today is that nothing, nothing, nothing is too good for your baby. Nothing's too good for your children. I, I cannot help but believe that Thanksgiving dinners and Christmas dinners are just warm-ups for the greatest event that's going to take place. May I tell you this morning, may I tell you this morning that maybe you didn't know about this because you've been so busy with your family that the bombs are falling in Israel. Maybe, maybe you haven't heard the bombs are falling in Jerusalem. 
Tel Aviv. Maybe you haven't heard, but I tell you today, the rapture of the church is imminent. Yes, it is. It's at hand. Yes, it is. We're close. Yes, we may, 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 perhaps, perhaps you didn't hear about the earthquake that was measured on the Richter scale that was over nine points. They said it happened, but we can't find it. They're looking for a, that was, that was just yesterday. Maybe you were so busy polishing your world up that you didn't hear about the five point something earthquake that happened in Oklahoma just yesterday. Somebody said in the last days, perilous times shall come. Somebody said nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes and pestilence in divers places. Seemed like somebody sent out a warning. You know what? I saw something that was so special. Maybe you don't know who Paul Crouch is. Paul Crouch is the founder of the Trinity Broadcasting Network. He and his wife, Paul Crouch, TBN. And I saw him. He was out in like a four-wheel drive. He wasn't driving. He was in the back seat. And somebody was driving. They're going across this. It's like this desert plain place. It's like God-forsaken place somewhere in India. And they got the camera on him. And, and he's holding in his hand a smartphone. Paul Crouch, 78 years old, <laughs> holding in his hand in some desert place somewhere in India, a phone. And he's watching the Trinity Broadcasting Network in a desert in India. Yeah. 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 Does it like that? Mm -hmm. Live. If you're not ready to meet God, I hope this scares the hell out of you. Come on. Amen. Because if I told you this morning that I have that I have a glass of water, if I have a glass of water, and when I pour, if I pour this water out on this carpet, as soon as the water hits the carpet, it is then wet. Is that confusing? Simple to me. Carpet's dry. Until then happens. Then means then. I pour the water out and when the water hits the carpet, it is then. Can you say then? Man. Then the carpet is wet. Not before. Then. Come on, one more. Then. then. Come on, then. then. What? Say then. The Bible says, and this gospel shall be preached into all the world. Whoa! No, no, no. And this gospel shall be preached into all the world. Amen. Then we'll have another thousand years. No! This gospel shall be preached into all the world. Then shall the end come. Come on, church. It's time for you and me to wake up. I'm telling you, the rapture of the church is imminent. It's about to take place, and we're going home. Not one will be missing at that marriage supper table. That's why Jesus died. Yes, that's why Jesus died. Oh, I, I don't mean to cause you an alarm, but I know Jesus died for your sins. I know you were a bad, 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 bad boy. And he died that you might live, but he died so you could be able to go into the presence of the Father without any fear, without any condemnation, without any unrighteousness. He died that you might be able to have the fellowship with the Father that was lost in the garden. I mean, just any day now, trumpet's gonna sound and we're getting out of here. One of the days they're gonna look for us, we ain't gonna be here. We're gonna be gone.